Hello there, and welcome to the opener. This week, it seems like we've had some sort of global disaster. Oh my god, we've got some sort of terrible outbreak. I should keep these on because they're for my face. I'm a scientist, and this is Pandemic. Now this time we've got a bit of a mega opener in the fact that we're looking at Pandemic and both of the expansions. And the interesting thing here is that the expansions aren't like normal expansions. They don't just add extra expansive, crazier stuff for kind of expert players to play with. They actually change the way that the game works. And they change the way the game works in interesting ways. Obviously you get all the extra stuff as well, you know, you get nice new cards, nice new bits, but they're better than that. But before we get into all that, what is Pandemic? Well, it's a simple co-op game where you have to work together to try and stop viruses from wiping out humanity. Every player in Pandemic gets their own turn, but it's very much a collaborative experience. You have to work out how you're gonna logistically do things. Should you fly someone out to Japan and start clearing up the virus that might cause another outbreak? Or should you try and concentrate on getting to Atlanta, getting to the CDC or building another virus lab so you can hopefully cure one of these things more easily? It's a game that's very difficult when you first start playing it, but it's so much fun to just sit and plan. Hang on, hang on, what about if you fly to Paris, meet me here, and I can give you the samples we need to create a vaccine for the blue disease. It's so exciting to play with friends when you can all work together, work out a solution, and maybe save the world? Having said that, saving the world is not always terribly easy. There are loads of ways you can lose pandemic. If you keep drawing cards and you run out of cards to draw, you've just lost pandemic. If you get chain outbreaks and you get too many chain outbreaks because you haven't managed to keep places from spilling out and becoming these horrible zones of infections, you lose pandemic. If you run out of any one color of cube, if you've maybe ignored the yellow infection, you'll sort that out later you've lost Pandemic. It's a very difficult game to win, but the process of watching it all fall apart while you do your best to hang it together is tons of fun. Pandemic divides the world into four different colored areas, which means you also have four different colors of disease to try and wipe out. But after every turn you lovingly spend going around trying to clean things up, you draw new cards from the infection deck. The infection deck makes new little cubes appear on the map. But to add insult to injury, the cards that you need to win the game, i.e. collecting multiple of the same color cards so you can create cures, or just the cards that you need to fly around the world quickly, meet up with your mates, trade cards, try and find a cure. Inside this main deck that sits on the board, you have a number of these cards. Epidemics. Every time you find an epidemic card, you get a brand new nasty infection and the rate at which infections will spread is increased for the rest of the game. They're very nasty, but in the stroke of genius, they are evenly distributed throughout the deck. It's one of the little setup things you have to do that's actually very smart. You never know exactly where they'll be, but you know when you haven't seen one for a while, one's gonna come. So it's a cooperative, globe-hopping, virus-based puzzle, and one that people can get involved with in their own time. But one thing that makes it a really, really great co-op game, that most good co-ops game need, is the fact that you have all these different roles. Now, obviously, both the expansions add brand new roles and variations of the roles to work with the different variations of the different vari games. But the important thing about the roles are they can each do different things. Medics can swoop around the map removing cubes at an alarming rate. They're the guys who save the day when it looks like Johannesburg is gonna be wiped out. The important thing about the roll cards is they allow each player at some point in the game to have their moment where they think, I can do this, I can do this. By giving somebody a unique trait, you can step up and you can be a hero, even if it sounds like your job is quite boring. Now, Pandemic is a fantastic opener because of the fact that A, it's non-competitive, which is something that really puts a lot of people off from gaming. You know, a lot of people don't want to win, they just want to have fun. Myself included, although winning can be quite sweet. 
Secondly, it's kind of an interesting idea. It's not something that is drowning and soggy in masculine tropes. You know, I like a wizard war and I like sci-fi space combat, but I can appreciate some people just maybe find the connotations behind all that stuff can put them off getting involved with the gaming side of things, and that's what's crucial. Having something where effectively you're scientists saving the world from a plague, that's something that most people can be interested in. But it's not just the removal of fiery competition that makes collaborative games so enticing for people who've never played board games before. It's the fact that also people can sit back and get involved at their own pace. There's nothing wrong with just spending the first few rounds of Pandemic watching what's going on and just being quite passive, letting other people effectively help you make decisions while you get a feeling for it and get into it. You know, you're not expected to be like super excited and fully involved immediately. You don't have to be. And that's quite valuable, I think, because a lot of the time, as with any type of games, people who don't know them, people who don't understand the systems, people on the fringe, often feel very intimidated by the fact that as people who've been doing it for a long time, we have knowledge that they don't. So that's one of the main reasons that Pandemic is a fantastic opener. And for the reasons I've just explained, for the first few times you play Pandemic, it is the perfect opener. However, it doesn't stay that way. It evolves, it mutates. And after a couple of sessions of Pandemic, you start to develop a real problem. Now the problem here is expertise in the fact that if you keep playing Pandemic, with different groups of people, you will get better at it. Whereas the people you keep playing with, well, they won't because they'll be new to the game. And that's fine, but it's very difficult to not allow your expertise of the game to influence the way that the games pan out. You start to get an appreciation for the systems in the game and you know what to do and they don't know what to do. And you get into a situation where effectively you have become the leader. So you're trying to introduce people into these games and you're trying to be like, we should play this game, it's great fun, it's collaborative, but it stops being collaborative and it starts being you telling everyone what to do. You gotta move here, you do this, and you're right. That's the problem, is you know how to play the game. Now I had to stop playing Pandemic because as mentioned earlier, I'd kind of become a kind of leader bully. I was telling everyone what to do, it wasn't fun for new players. And that's why I got incredibly excited when I heard about On The Brink. The main variant in this expansion allows one player to effectively compete against the rest of the group, which means someone like me who understands the game and understands the mechanics that are built in to try and stop you can, instead of telling everyone else what to do and helping them solve the game, I can use that knowledge against them, making the game more interesting and more dynamic by adding a human brain to an already quite nasty system. And also, whilst doing it, I get to be a bioterrorist. <laughs> and as a bioterrorist, you get your own flavor of little cubes. You get these cute little purple things. And you just move silently around the map, occasionally dotting one there, and then I'm gonna fly to Karachi. Mm. You just wait, you just wait until the rest of the people are having a really bad time dealing with something on the other side of the world, dealing with something they really don't want to deal with anything else. What do you do? You start causing new outbreaks, purple outbreaks. Hell, it's fantastic fun. The bioterrorism variant not only fixes the major problem of having the person who owns the game understanding it more than everyone else and making it no fun for everyone else, it also means you get an entirely different dynamic. The other guys playing the main game still have this fantastic back and forth. They're debating, they're worried, what should we do, should we do this, should we do that? Whereas the bioterrorist, you have a completely opposite experience. You sit there in silence, listening to them planning. They're not allowed to hide their planning from you, that's an important rule. They have to have it all open so you can see what they're doing. But while they sit there and try and work out the best solution for saving the world, you just sit there, silently grinning, writing your orders on a notebook. You're not even on the board. The only time you appear on the board as a bioterrorist is when somebody happens to walk through a city that you're in. The rest of the time, everything you do is just secret. You write down what you're doing on a piece of paper. What are you doing? None of your business. Leave me alone. I'm a bioterrorist. The other great thing about the On The Brink expansion 
My favourite thing has got to be one of the variants you can do with the Epidemic cards. We mentioned earlier, Epidemic cards obviously are these horrible green things that suddenly cause brand new infections. There's a virulent strain version. And what that does is it means at the start of the game, you end up choosing one of these colours. One of these diseases is going to be nastier than the rest. And it means that instead of using these standard cards, you use special ones that add new rules that only apply to that disease they can really mess you up. When I was playing as the bioterrorist, I had a situation whereby they couldn't get through. It became a horrible blockade disease, and it meant that government restrictions weren't allowing people to pass through as quickly. And it just ruined their team. It ruined them. It was glorious. Now, in the lab works by effectively entirely reworking the way that creating cures works in Pandemic, and the way it does that is by creating a brand new bit of board, which is the lab. And effectively, you have to nip around the world collecting colored cubes by curing them in the same way you do in the normal game. But then you have to use these samples to create the cures that then get rid of the diseases. It kind of creates another mini game in addition to the main game. But the problem here is that because you need specific samples from these cards that tell you which colours you need to create a cure for this particular disease, there's a chance that you might not be able to do it. Because those of you who've played lots of Pandemic will know that often it's a good idea to completely eradicate one of the diseases very early in the game. If you do that whilst playing the in the lab variant though, you may end up needing a sample of a disease that has been entirely destroyed by humanity. Oh, humans are the bad guys once again. In the lab furthers its appeal for hardcore, serious or long-time pandemic players by adding a competitive mode where two teams of scientists can go around the world not just trying to save the world, but also earning prestige in the process. A mode which kind of horribly mirrors the real-world realities of pharmaceutical companies and profits. It's pretty dark, but if you play the game a lot and you want some more, In The Lab is awesome for that. And that's it for this month's opener. Pandemic. Fantastic game expanded by brilliant expansions that not only add more things to create longevity for hardcore fans, they add new tools, allowing you to change the game, allowing you to adapt it, to suit the needs of whoever you're playing with. If you're playing with quite a few advanced players, play within the lab. Maybe go for the competitive game mode. If, however, it's you trying to introduce board games to new people, then rather than you running the risk of telling everyone what to do and being bossy, boring pants, play as a bioterrorist. Let them work the game out for themselves whilst you appreciate the game from a different and far more evil angle. But enough about that. It's time to get extravagant. And I always feel that there's one drink in particular that really hammers home that feeling of camaraderie, of friends sitting together, sharing ideas, and, you know, feeling like a proper team. And that drink is whiskey. Today's extravagance is a cocktail called penicillin. It's not the cheapest cocktail in the world, I've got to be honest, but it is thematic, and that's, that's what we're here for. So it's a whiskey-based cocktail with ginger, lemon, honey, and most importantly, perhaps, this stuff, which is Le Frog. Le Frog, which is French for the frog. It's quite an expensive whiskey, but you only need a little bit of it for this cocktail, which means you can either make loads of these cocktails, or you could drink it on its own. And of course, you'll also need um, another whiskey of your choice, perhaps a malt. I've gone for a blend rather than, a, I don't really know what these things mean. And a generic cocktail gubbins and uh, ice. Ice is in the freezer though, because if you put ice on a table, it doesn't tend to, to be ice. First of all, take a decent squeeze of honey, put it in a pan, and then add roughly the same amount of water. For the record, I'm making enough for two cocktails here, because I'm just that kind of gentleman. Peel and slice a chunk of ginger, and then put that into the pan, boil it all together on medium heat, for a little while. Let it cool down and the ginger will do magical things with the honey. And then you're gonna to wanna to add about 40, 45 milliliters of this ginger syrup into a cocktail mixer with about the same amount of freshly squeezed lemon juice, 
just over 100 milliliters of your blended whiskey or a single malt if you're using it. And then about 15 to 20 milliliters, not much, of the French Frog or special whiskey. Shake it around with loads of ice and probably look vaguely insane in the process. And then that's it. Just drink it. Cool. And there we have a penicillin. Cheers. Cheers for watching. I'll see you next month. <laughs>